uh, different names. It was the Feast of the Passover, sometimes called the Feast of the First Fruits. And uh, verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf offering before the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, and the priest shall wave it. Ye shall offer that day when you have the sheaf and he lamb without blemish the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two-tenths deal of fine flour. Uh, remember something, when you're reading about a meat offering or meat in the Bible, it doesn't mean flesh. It means food or a meal. And uh, if it's going to be uh, flesh, it'll, it usually says flesh. But they, you offer this uh, flour uh, to, to the Lord as a meat offering. It doesn't mean meat like we think of meat. You know, we, if we say meat, we're thinking about a hog or a cow or a lamb, but that wasn't it. He said, the meat offering shall be of two-tenth deals of fine flour, mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and a drink offering thereof shall be of wine, and uh, the fourth part of a hen. Yes, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought in the offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dealing, dwellings, and ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you, that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. Okay, that's, that's uh, 49 days that you're going to count. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50. Pentecost actually means 50. It's the 50th day after the Passover. So you got 49 days, and then the morrow of that is the 50th day, and that's, that is the day of Pentecost. So you begin, when you begin harvesting that barley, don't eat none of it. Don't eat, even eat it green. Don't eat it in the ear. But you got to first bring it to God and offer it to God. I mean, you know, I like to go out and get that fresh corn when it first comes in and fry some in the skillet. Don't you like those fresh roasting ears? That's the best, best meal you can get if you've got a few purple hull peas to go with it and, and maybe a little uh, okra breaded and fried. And I mean, I'm talking myself into a hunger fit right now. But you, you, can, uh, you can eat. I don't care whether there's any uh, flesh or not at that day. And the fact is, the other day my wife was going to fix me some beans and some okra and uh, corn. And I, I, she said, what kind of meat do you want? I said, I don't want none. Just cook me some cornbread. Cook them, cook them vegetables, and I'm going to act like they're fresh. They weren't fresh. They were frozen, but I'm telling you, they were, they were fresh frozen, I guess. They sure was good. Didn't care whether they had any bologna or not at that day, and I still don't. If I've got a good plate of uh, good-tasting vegetables. So he said, you can't eat none of it either in the ear. You can't eat it green. Don't, don't put it in your mouth until you come in and brought that sheaf before the Lord and you waved it before God and you thanked him for a harvest. This is the beginning of it. So you're thanking him before you harvest it, just when you start. You bring the first fruits of it and you give it to God and you thank him for it and uh, don't eat it until you do. That's a pretty good, pretty good thing to do. Solomon come along and he said, honor God with thy first fruits and with all of thy substance. So give God honor for everything that you have, but don't be sure you don't leave the first fruits out of this. You shall bring, in verse 17, you shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of tenth of deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, you notice this said with leaven in the other places. There's never a other burnt offering that I know of anywhere in the Bible that you offered with leaven. As a rule, leaven was a type of sin. However, there's one case in the New Testament, one in the Old Testament where it's not, and that is right here. You offer these with leaven. That's a great exception that's made there. When Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a woman who hid two measures, hid leaven in two measures of meal until the whole was leavened. I may not have quoted that just right. But you know where I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about at least. I don't know where it is or I'd look it up right now. But anyway, you hide that leaven in there and it, that leaven will leaven the whole lump. 
a little bit of leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's the only place that I know of in the New Testament where leaven is not used as a type of sin. In other places, it's you, even where it says a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. That Paul is writing to the first Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5, and he's telling them, if you've got a little sin in your life, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe out the whole bunch. You better get it out. Purge out that old leaven that you may be a new lump, he said. So, but leaven is uh, usually used because it, it grows in such a manner. It's, uh, could we say cancerous without being cancerous? It grows like cancer, but it doesn't cause cancer. That's not what I'm saying. You, you shall offer this bread uh, with this bread seven lambs without a blemish in the first year and one young bullock, two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord and their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs for the first of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread and the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs, and they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Ye shall proclaim in the selfsame day that it may be holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statue forever in your dwellings throughout your generation. Something else before I move from that. Now, th that was at Pentecost there. This last one was after you counted the 50 days, you'd done it again. That was the end of the wheat harvest. So you'd went through your barley and your wheat from the Passover to, to uh, Pentecost. Now then, uh, when it said uh, this is for you throughout your dwellings or in all your dwellings throughout your generations, over and over they're told that. And when it says throughout your generations, if you remember in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the, begin, the book, the beginning of the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. We don't live in their generations. We don't offer the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5 again, Christ who is our Passover is sacrificed for us. Jesus became a fulfilling of all of the law we live in the generation of Jesus Christ. We're not under the law for righteousness. And the law is ended for righteousness. Now, it's still there. And many things in the law teach us the nature of God. So we still need to know the law. It teaches us God's nature. But we do not live under the sacrificial law or the dietary law of the Old Testament. We're living in the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, I told you I'd read this later, verse 22, the last verse. Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. We're going to skip down one chapter, get to Ruth, chapter 2, verse 23. She kept the fast, she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. We die to sin at the altar of repentance, which is at the Passover. We're made alive by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is at Pentecost. And uh, that, that was a time frame that God had set forth. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall, we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in its lusts thereof. In the lusts thereof. When you read that word reckon, I've... I've went through this numerous times, but all of you weren't here. So you that were, and remember it, hold on to it. And you that don't, let me explain. We use reckon rather loosely, and we use it in a different term from biblical days. He said, likewise, reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin. And you might, somebody might ask you, are you going to do so and so? And you say, I reckon so. That means you might. You, you may be. That, that's the way we use it. I, I might do that. I, I'm, I'm planning right now to, but it's not a definite thing. But reckoning was used different in Bible times, and even in early American times it was used different. When uh, 
sailors cross the seas from England over to America or anywhere else, they used a sextant before the modern GPS things were used. Even, even some of our more modern times, they used the sextant. It was a measuring tool that they used the relation of the sun and certain points to locate themselves in the sea where there's no land visible and also to point them in the direction on a map that they were wanting to go. No roads, no side ditches, no white lines, no yellow lines. And they could locate and pinpoint themselves in that sea by the use of a sextant and a method they called reckoning. And it was so accurate, they called it dead reckoning. In other words, they was dead on. They were, they were right on the spot. They could, a man that was good at reading the sextant could pinpoint that sea, that ship out on a vast sea where there was no other markers whatsoever and he did it by the sun and the stars and that instrument and reckoning. It was an accurate, absolute measurement and an absolute way of measuring. And that's what Paul is saying here. You be absolutely sure you're dead unto sin and alive unto God. We died through the uh, repentance. We come alive through the infilling gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let's go back to Ruth. She come in at the repentance stage. She come in at the time that represented repentance, the time of the Passover. And she stayed there and gleaned as a servant and as a handmaid until the time of Pentecost when life came into her. Boaz said, there is a man that's closer to me, but if he won't do that uh, deed of a, a brother unto you, I will. And of course, I mentioned that law before if a man died without a seed, his brother married his widow and raised up seed. And the firstborn in that couple, life was the seed of the dead person so that nobody's name was wiped out in Israel. Elimelech's two children had died, Malon being uh, the eldest and the, the husband of Ruth, he had died. And so Boaz went down to the gate of the city after the wheat harvest and uh, the beginning of the winnowing of the barley harvest as they got them together and they started uh, the, har the, the winnowing of it. And Ruth went down there and the next morning he made sure that he seen that cousin at the gate of the city where business was transacted. And he said, I've got a field to advertise before you and it, the inheritance is yours. You're to buy that field of Naomi. And he said, I'll buy it. He said, at what time you buy that field, you're getting Ruth the Moabitess for your wife. And that's the law of redemption. He said, uh, I can't do it. It'll mar my own inheritance. Now the law read something severe if, there, if Boaz hadn't been standing there to say, I'll buy it then. There was that law of redemption that stated further, if a man refused to raise up seed to his brother, the wife of that dead brother would come and loose his shoe, spit in his face, put him to shame and he would be called the rest of his life the man who had his shoe loosed because he refused to honor his brother that had died and provide seed for him and keep his name alive in Israel. But since Boaz was there and he said, I will, I will take it up. You're before me, but if you don't want it, I will take it. And so he said, well, you redeem it for yourself. He got his shoe loose, but she didn't spit in his face and he was, was not put to shame because it was an agreement and the full law of redemption did not take uh, charge there. The reason I love the book of Ruth is it exposes so much of the law in real life. The law of redemption, the law of the harvest where they left the corners of the field, the, the, the law of the dead brother. Uh, they, they just so many different laws that are, that are brought to uh, fulfillment there in the book of Ruth is what makes the book of Ruth so rich in every chapter, some of them are revealed, and it's revealed in just everyday living. Now, all of you know that have read Ruth and uh, have thought about what you were reading when you were reading Ruth, that Ruth has a, uh, a real touching scene over and over and over again. There's a reason. As I mentioned, God had these people picked out. Boaz... If I ask you, who was the mother of Boaz? Some of you will know because it's pretty prominent. She was Rahab the harlot. 
she was married to a man named Salmon. Salmon was the son of Naashon. Naashon was the leader of all of the tribe of Judah. When Israel was in the wilderness and on the move, Naashon, he's never a man of notoriety in the Bible, but if you just go back on his lineage, uh, he was Aaron's brother-in-law. But he, Aaron had married his sister. And so Salmon was Aaron's nephew. And he married Rahab the harlot. And she was an outsider. And Boaz knew from the stories of mother what it was like to be rejected. He knew what a, a, a sinful life was. And he knew the mercy of God. Every one of us can testify to the fact that we have seen the mercy of God in action. We once were lost, but now we're saved. We were outsiders. We were cursed by sin. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in these sayings of the law to do them. All of us failed. We come short of the glory of God. All of us that are filled with the Holy Ghost have been uh, recipients of the great mercies of God that took the unclean and made a clean thing out of it. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, folks. The book of Ruth is full of mercy. It's full of salvation. It's full of the goodness of God. It's portrayed there over and over again. But this Naashon was the leader of the tribe of Judah. Judah was front and center when the ark was in the wilderness. And when the cloud moved or the ball of fire moved, Judah was the first one to move. The leader of that tribe got up and moved first. So Naashon was the man that was the first mover. Moses and Aaron were camped down with the Levites right around the uh, uh, tabernacle. Judah was front and center on the north side of the tabernacle and they were the first ones to follow the movement of the cloud. Naashon was the leader of Judah, so he was the first one in the whole camp to step, take a step toward following the cloud. And it, the, each tribe fell in line right after them according to their tribes and according to what God had said. Salmon had been raised in a very godly home. Why would he marry such a woman? God picked that out. God set that in order. God saved her, a woman of faith. By faith, Rahab the harlot. By faith, Rahab the harlot. That don't sound right, does it? Amen. I mean, you get faith in, in the harlot all in one sentence. But she perished not with the others because she believed God. Salmon was the spy that had come in and camped on her rooftop under the flax, and they hunted for him. Later, he took that woman for his wife as she was cleansed and received into the tribe of Judah, into the tribes of Israel. And she became, of course, of the tribe of Judah then. And she was the mother to Boaz. Boaz was the, wife, the husband of Ruth. Both of these outsiders, both of these outcasts that had been made nigh symbolically by the blood of Jesus, God received them, accepted them in mercy, and then later on, they were listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. They were the progenitors of Jesus himself. I'm so glad you're in Sunday school, and I'm glad it's over with. 